Umar Ahmed, IFL TV, MTK Global, final press conference with Dubois Gorman of two days out. I'm joined by Trish Dixon. How are you doing, Trish? Yeah, really well, thanks, Umar. How about you? Good, thank you. It's been a... When's the last time you were on IFL? It's been a good while now. It's been a few years since, since Coogan and, and James been me. Uh, I don't, yeah, it's been a good couple of years, I think. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's about time we got you on. Um, what, what are your thoughts uh, leading into this fight? Uh, obviously, a lot's been made about Daniel's power. A lot's been made about Nathan's boxing skills. Do you see it as a, either Daniel stoppage or, or Nathan points win, or do you think something else might happen? Yeah, I think those would be the dominant schools of thought. Um, great fight. Really, really intriguing fight. Uh, it's fascinated me from the start. A couple of things about it from, from what I've seen with interviews with the guys over the last few weeks. He's actually took Daniel Dubois on the pads in the Peacock a few weeks ago. And feeling his power was just staggering. And I know, obviously, I'm no pad man and, and, and not massively experienced in that respect. But to feel, his, to feel his power on the pads, it just made me think that, you know, the human body and head is not designed to be hit by those sort of bombs. Um, so if Gorman can stand up to that, fair play. Uh, I think what staggers me by, uh, I think what, what surprised me with Gorman is exactly how confident he is, because he seems so assured, like it's like it's he basically has to show up to win. And he's convinced he's got Dubois' number. So when you got Dubois' power, which I think is extraordinary, against Gorman's confidence, which is equally extraordinary, I just you know I really couldn't pick, really couldn't pick a, a guy who's going to win, and that's why we want to see it. Who else have you taken on the pads? Um, oh, jeez. Well, most recently, I suppose, right, Frank, most recently, um, Liam Williams I took on the pads up in, uh, up in Sheffield at the England gym. Did some body belt work with Kid, Gall Gall Kid Galahad as well. Uh, Liam Williams, a, a real banger as well, and a volume puncher, so a guy that, a guy that you don't want swarming all over you, that's for sure. Mm. Where do you think uh, the winner goes from this fight, and where do you think the loser goes from this fight? I do think the winner will be knocking on the door of a, of a top five world rating. Um, yeah. And so they're going to be right in the mix, um, rightly or wrongly. Um, and I think the loser, depending on how they lose, they're, going to, they're so young they can come again. I think that's the beauty of this fight. I think this is the, the beauty of not putting any pressure on a fighter having a loss on his record. Is you know we saw with Rose and Degel, which I know is constantly referenced to in this fight. Is you know it doesn't mean the loser doesn't become a bad fighter. The loser can still go on to win world titles and so forth. And I think that's the beauty of these guys fighting at this stage of their career. Is they're, they're young enough to come back. They could be you know one whoever loses could still reach a world title fight before whoever wins um, so whoever wins is going to be right in the mix for a really big fight uh, whoever loses you know the way boxing works the way politics works in the sport they might be even closer than the guy who wins I do want to ask you about the heavyweight division on a, on a, on a broader uh, landscape obviously there's a lot of a talk between Tyson Fury and Dylan White going on at the moment we don't know how realistic that fight is actually in the ring but there's Bit of talk about we're going to take it outside the ring when I see you. Uh, <laughs> we're going to get it on basically. Uh, what do you make of all that? Do you think it's tongue in cheek, media hype, or do you think they're being serious, them two guys? Um, I think we've always had that, and I think you know, if people, people talk about Tyson and how media savvy he's become, maybe he will um, sort of talk the talk. But I think at the moment, Tyson's focused on becoming a role model, and I think he will have to let his actions speak differently to his words. And so if that scenario comes about, then you'd like to think that he would not get involved in any way, shape or form. Uh, same thing with Dylan. You know, Dylan's been knocking on this, knocking on the door for a heavyweight title shot for so long that you'd be foolish to jeopardise anything now, um, having waited several hundred days for a shot and probably a few more hundred in the bank. But um, providing he doesn't slip up against Rivas, he's going to be in a, hopefully in a good position to, to make a title, to have a run at the title. Mm. Of course, we're expecting an announcement on uh, Joshua Ruiz. Um, there's been suggestions that Joshua should take a year out. Some people saying, some people saying he should jump into the rematch. Um, some people saying he should take another option. What's your sort of feelings towards it? Does he have to take that Ruiz rematch? So I think you'd have to look at the contract and see what it says. Uh, if it's an immediate rematch and that's the only fight that Joshua can have, or else Ruiz is gone, then he's probably got to take the sort of take the chance while all the belts are still held by one fighter before they get splintered and he's got to try and regroup them from different people. Um, so I think there's that political element to it where you know if you can beat one guy for three belts it's going to be easier than him trying to start to unify uh, again. And I think with regards to Joshua, I think what's difficult to know is if there was nothing wrong, if there was no 
if there was nothing bad at play and he was 100% and his camp was great, then why would you want to take a rematch? You know, what, you know, what, what gives you that assurance that you can win a rematch after what happened in the first mm. fight? if there was nothing wrong. So maybe if they're confident about a rematch, maybe something was wrong that we just haven't heard about. Okay. What are your feelings again towards that rematch if it does happen? Are you leaning towards Joshua or Ruiz? Um, as things stand, I'd probably lean towards Ruiz just based on what happened in the first fight. Um, Joshua landed some bombs. Ruiz, apart from going down, didn't look overly hurt uh, at the time he took them. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's such a big mental game. In, in some respects, it reminds me a bit of Frotch and Groves in the sense that Frotch didn't think Groves had anything that could really hurt him. And then he found out he did. And then um, he actually saw Chris Marshall, the, the Team GB sports psychologist, mm. um, to try and get his head around the fact that I think Groves wasn't just this uppity kid who could inflict some damage. I think he really tried to get his head around that. I'm not sure what Joshua would do differently, but I think I'd have to... I'd have to lean towards Ruiz just based on confidence and probably where their heads are. Um, obviously, for, for British boxing, it would be huge for Joshua to get his titles back and talk about fighting to fight in the likes of Dylan White again, fighting the likes of Fury, getting back in the mix with Wilder. But take nothing away from Ruiz, who obviously earned, earned the belts that night. Okay, Tris, appreciate uh, your thoughts on the heavyweight division at the moment. More importantly, though, uh, it's kind of a split question. How's your podcast going? How's the role at BT going? Um, podcast is going well, Roller BT is great. Uh, the BT gig is the most enjoyable thing I've done in boxing, I think. Um, it's great, you know, you get to go around to the gyms and, and speak to the fighters and the trainers, which is boxing at the base element, which is, you know, fighters tend to be smashing blokes as to the trainers. So you kind of leave the politics out of it. You can just go around, interview the guys. And I think BT's got a really burgeoning stable with Frank. You know, you speak to the guys like Yard, um, Gorman, Dubois, who are obviously fighting on this bill. Uh, we've got Frampton, Conlon, um, the stable stick, and they're full of interesting guys as well, great characters to go around speaking to. Liam Williams, another one, and then obviously the trainers are involved with, so Adam Booth, Dominic Ingle, and so forth. They're all, all great guys. Tunde. <laughs> Tunde, Jamie Moore, all good talkers, mm. all, all good to spend time with. Uh, podcast, um, hopefully it's going well, hopefully the people are enjoying it. Um, I don't really do a lot of podcast management in terms of looking at the stats, but from the feedback I get, fingers crossed it's going okay and people seem to be enjoying it. Uh, episode 41's just gone live with Jamie Moore. Um, 41 episodes in, I didn't, didn't think it would last that long, but it's doing okay, I think. Must be doing something right. Wish you all the best uh, with your roles at uh, BT and your, on your podcast. Uh, anything you want to add? No, just looking forward to this fight. Really am, really am split. Who, who are you going for? I'll tell you off camera. Thank okay. you, Trace. Yeah, cheers. <laughs>